What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This podcast is powered by Stick and Ball TV, the baseball and softball streaming platform. If you're a coach with a growth mindset who wants to get better, then Stick and Ball is just for you. With weekly updated videos from some of the greatest softball and baseball coaches in the country, it's an absolute no-brainer. Check them out at stickandball.tv or on the Stick and Ball TV mobile app. Today we have on Justin James, head baseball coach at Point Loma Nazarene University. Coach James is in his third season as the head coach and returned to his alma mater to take over as the head coach in the summer of 2018. He has over 13 years of college coaching experience, including two as the pitching coach at UC San Diego, where he helped the Tritons to back-to-back NCAA West Regional Championships. In his first season as the leader of the program, James guided them to a 32-21 record, a pair of postseason victories, and into the final game of the NCAA West Regional number 2. The Sea Lions ranked as high as number 2 in the West Regional poll and reached number 14 in the national ranking. In his second season, it was cut short due to the COVID pandemic, and at the time, the Sea Lions were playing their best baseball. With a 3-1 conference record and in second place in the Pac West standings. So on the show, we discuss how they practice this fall. We go over program standards, and how they utilize game-like practices to steal reps and get ready for the season. Here is Justin James. Coach James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited uh, to rejoin you again. No doubt, no doubt. I'm, I'm excited too. And I'm really, uh, last time we talked, you were just a pitching coach. Well, I don't want to say just a pitching coach, but you were a pitching coach. And now you're sitting in the head coach chair, the newly monogrammed ones with the logos on it and everything in your office, <laughs> right. which is sick. Uh, but uh, since we, that was a couple of years ago, and so I'm, I'm so thankful for our friendship since then. And, and I'm so thankful to be able to have you as a sounding board for different things. But uh, I would love to hear. So uh, a couple of years ago, you actually came back to where you're at now. So which is literally the most beautiful ballpark in the country and the most beautiful view in the country. So I'd love to, you know, talk, talk to our guests a little bit about Point Loma and, you know, what it's meant to you and then what the vision looked like for you whenever you came back and took over as the head, as the head coach. Yeah. So uh, Point Loma is a a pretty special place uh, for anyone who ends up coming here um, specifically for myself Uh, being a player graduating from here, uh, leaving and then actually coming back again, uh, it just means a whole lot more. It's it's a character-based program and school. It's a little bit on the smaller end, which is good for a lot of people. And it's just quality people on the whole entire campus. So it's very easy for uh, freshmen to come in and feel a little bit more comfortable. Transfers come in, this and that. And there's just a whole lot more going on than just baseball, which I think nowadays it might be more valuable than ever. And pretty special. I got to work under a really awesome friend uh, and teammate uh, under Joe Schaefer, who's now at Northwest Nazarene. And he ran a great program here for a long time and taught me really uh, some invaluable uh, information and and just how to go about your business, being a little bit more calmer in certain situations and stuff like that. And we have two different kind of ways of attacking it, but uh, basically overall here, the player is, very important when it comes to character growth and stuff like that. And that's continued from him leaving and then me coming back. I love hearing that. So I've never been a head coach. I I think that, you know, most people who, uh, most people who get into coaching have aspirations of that at some point in their career. And so the next question that I want to ask is, is something that I've never experienced. So I love hearing the answer to it's you go through the interview process and you decide to take the job. And then the next question is, what do I do next? Like, I, I'm thinking, oh, man, there's like there's a manual for for interview questions and you can talk to people about that. But there's not necessarily a manual of like your first 100 days in the head coach's office. So I would love to hear, you know, what you did, uh, what you did well, things that you would change, advice that you would give for anybody in a similar situation. Uh, that's a very, very valid question. Um, <laughs> It's, it's crazy. The first kind of hundred days, uh, no matter what, 
And basically when the first hundred days, when I got the job, I, I wanted to first and foremost being back here and, and having experience here was to improve alumni relations and get the fundraising going and start to set um, a different style uh, of baseball that uh, just from learning from different coaches and guys that I worked under that I thought would be uh, more of the direction I wanted to head to. And then also, you know, try and get this uh, program to continue to be a faith-based program and teach it through uh, baseball and stuff like that. And that was kind of my first 100 days. It wasn't a whole lot of what did I want to do necessarily baseball wise, but I can tell you when you do get into this position, it's uh, can be in, in a way nerve wracking because you just have never done it before. And there's just a lot of things you don't know and your day looks way different. You come into the office and as an assistant, your day is pretty much told to you and you already know pretty much what your job is when you work under uh, good, good coaches, head coaches, which I've had the privilege of. As a head coach, you need to start getting a whole lot more organized because the minute you step on campus, it literally can change in a heartbeat and it could, uh, it could be Armageddon. And uh, what you needed to do started to become something that has to be done in an hour. And all of a sudden, now you don't get anything that you needed to get done because five other things popped up. And I think learning to manage that time management uh, was really crucial Otherwise, my day would go in any direction, and it really wasn't under, under my control. So one of the things I started to do a little bit better of and forced to do was just make sure writing down things, making a list of what are my top, uh, and I'm teaching our players that this year. and We'll probably get into that a little bit, but just MITs, like what's the most important task? What can I get done the night before or early in the morning before I step on campus? Uh, really allowed me to help the assistants more and then also have my day go a lot smoother. I love hearing that. And uh, again, it's, it's coming from a position that you, that I've never experienced. And then it's, would you, would you say that it, it is almost completely different than being an assistant coach? Because I, I think, and I, and I heard Cody Royal talk about this and he's, he's very big on uh, helping uh, head coaches. And I think he has a head coaches mentor program. He's a soccer coach in, think Canada, but he just talks about how people just aren't prepared for head coaches just from being an assistant coach. Uh, we think that we are because we provide input, uh, but we don't, we've never sat in that seat. And so a lot of coaches get really, I don't want to say burnt out, but they get really overwhelmed and they are not prepared for that moment as much as you could possibly be because you've never been in that experience uh, thoughts on that? Like, I, I would love to hear, you know, any, any takes that you have in regards to that. Right. I think it's just really important um, when you get a job that you've come somewhere where you've had success and had good mentors uh, that you worked under. And I think that helps lessen the curve. Obviously, you know, I think we all know when you work under someone really good, how they kind of handle the personal stuff for the most part, but just having a good skill set in terms of how to do, team stuff and the baseball end of it uh, really helps. So you know that no matter what, you're going to get your players better by these certain drills. And that's before you kind of make them your own. And that's kind of what I've learned is it doesn't have to look exactly like it did under Joe, or it didn't have to look exactly what it did under uh, Eric Newman at UCSD and uh, Steve Jones at New Mexico uh, Highlands. But all of those guys are very, very, very successful and they're doing it the right way, but I had to do it kind of my own way eventually. And I think the very first year, uh, it wasn't that way. I think I was trying to do it exactly the way they did it. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's the approach, but I think it's just kind of survival of that first year, get through it and start to understand kind of how you want to be and how you want to run your program and stuff like that. But there's no way coming from an assistant job in terms of, uh, moving to the head job that you can prepare other than being the best assistant possible you can and know every single aspect of a program from ordering uniforms and, um, you know, travel, the pitching side, the infield side, the hitting side is just have a grasp of all facets when you're the assistant. So when you get jumped in to a head job, you can kind of help delegate that and uh, have your assistants do the best job they possibly could. No, I love that. 
So one of the one of the next things that I think, you know, you you speak about a lot, and that's you know your standards and your culture that you're trying to build. And so I would love to hear, you know, when you took over the job, was that something that you that you already had in mind of what you wanted, or was it something that you decided with the coaches that you had and the team that you had? I, I, let me re- let me rewind it just a second, but. I think, you know, there, there's two different parts of that. There's, well, there's three. There's one that doesn't have anything that's that they probably won't work out very well. There's one that's like, I want this program to be uh, the best part of me. And, you know, if I'm going to be hired or fired, it's going to be based on my standards. And then there's another one that that is more of an all-encompassing thing. And not to say that either of those is right or wrong, but I think there, there's different ways uh, that different people approach it. So I would love to hear, you know, the standards that you put into place and you're laying that foundation for year one. What was it? What are they? Have you kept them? Have they changed over time? But just whenever whenever they think of you and your program, you know, what what are they looking at? What what would we notice whenever uh, we watched you guys play and and how you uh, how you guys just collected yourselves off the field and and all of anything and all of the above? Long question. Long, I guess. Yeah. uh, So once again, working under a different cup, uh, a couple of different head coaches, they all had their own styles and stuff like that. One of the best things I learned while going to UCSD was uh, learn under Eric Newman and kind of watch uh, standards be done in a different way than uh, Joe Schaefer did. And not one's better than the other, uh, but it's two different perspectives. And I was just really impressed when I went over to UCSD of just how well it, it was communicated and the standard was so high and I just thought that that was really exciting to be a part of and then you have uh you come back here and so you're starting to learn and and what do I want to be what do I want to be known for and stuff like that and this is no different it's starting to sound cliche but you want to grow the man up and you'll hear this pretty much in every podcast that you uh, listen to but you actually do have to hammer that down pretty good so uh, I tell recruits, I tell our players, like, uh, I'm pretty good on the baseball end if we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We can kind of fix that. Where I get the most irritated uh, and frustrated and probably spend too much time on at times is when we're not doing some of those other smaller job type things, communicating well, being responsible, treating other people right, just like it would be like a, a job. Uh, I don't handle all those as well as I probably should and still working on that. But when I took over, and we'll get to resources probably in a little bit, but uh, I really liked Craig Rochelle's idea of reward good behavior and in order for good behavior to continue to uh, occur in your program. So we implemented three uh, team values that we kind of go over. So our number one uh, value that we do is zeal. Zeal is just good vibes, good positive energy and enthusiasm for a common goal. I thought that would be a really good standard to have and to look for that stuff uh, on and off the field with our players. Then we have make it better, make it better. I got from Andy Stanley, who is a pastor in Georgia and I love his leadership stuff. I love his podcasts, uh, sermons. Also, I listen to both of those every single week uh, or listen to a sermons every single week. And when he does a new leadership podcast, uh, I jump on that right away and started all the way from the beginning But he basically has that as one of his uh, foundations of his um, uh, leadership, where anything that anyone does for us, player-wise, off-campus, administration, we're going to make sure we acknowledge that. And what can you do to make us better in any way? It literally could be you see a piece of trash and pick it up. Could be cleaning up the cages. Could be helping a coach feed, uh, feed the machine just anything. And it's so broad, which I'd like it to be broad. So then we can have a lot of good examples. And the last one's glorify. So I think just in myself included, there's just so many times where we're just not as grateful for things that we have been given. And it's very easy to do when you have a lot. And so one of ours is glorify. Obviously we're a Christian university. So glorify God first and foremost, But some of those guys who are on a different faith journey uh, and stuff like that is basically it's just a different way to see be grateful. And anything that we can be a player, seeing seeing them do something that helps another player, 
I want to make sure that we're going to lift them up and constantly lifting others up, glorifying and be grateful for what we have. So any of those examples we give a customized poker chip to, uh, to, and we take a picture and put it on social media. So this idea, once again, came from Craig Rochelle, but it also came from, we had a Navy SEAL come talk to us at UCSD and they had these coins that they give. So I kind of merged those two ideas together. And so now I have a thousand poker chips that we redesign every couple of years as our team logo or team values on there with our logo. And anytime administration uh, in admissions or financial aid or our, our SID, anyone, our strength coach, a player does anything to help us get better, uh, I will flip them a coin and make sure they're acknowledged. No, I love that. And I, I don't remember who said it, but somebody, it may have been Pastor Craig, but it's what gets praised gets repeated. And exactly. I, I've been really trying hard about that. Like the last, I don't, it's, it's always been something that's on my mind, but unless we're intentional about it, uh, like you mentioned, then it's really mm-hmm. hard to be able to do it. Because I find myself, I'm like, I, I want them to get better. And so I want to point out where they're wrong rather than, you know, praising what we want to be repeated. And I've noticed whenever I start right. to do that, it starts to get repeated. So it's, it's not something that's just cliche, but it's something like, oh, I want, like, I want some of that. Like, I, you know, instead of the fear tactic of, oh, I don't want to get in trouble. It's, oh, man, I want to be called out for doing something good. That's, so I, I love hearing that. Well, it just, it just, once again, when you're rewarded for something, you're going to want to repeat it. But then there's some guys who are not playing very good baseball and this game can really beat you down. Well, there's other ways and we're, we're really big right now. We'll probably get into this again a little bit later as well, but just really a lot more process oriented. And like, what does that mean? It's a little confusing. It can be. And so like, these are things that help you become a better baseball player, even when things aren't going your way you know, result wise and stuff like that. And I do, I do believe when you hit these three things we talk about, you will become a better person for sure, but also a better baseball player. No doubt in my mind. Uh, I know, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those that earlier in my career, I was like, man, these, you know, these guys are, are so talented. And then you, then I start to really notice like you, you have John Wooden's pyramid and you have, you know, Brad Stevens and they talk about, you know, the character has to be the foundation of, of who we are. And I, I think I heard it uh, like a week ago or, or two weeks ago, I read it somewhere where they talk about talent may win games, but character wins championships. And you start to notice success leaves clues. And I, I think that, that, you know, that, that only, <laughs> only having talent won't win you necessarily championships, but also uh, if you're only, if you don't have any talent, then you're not going to win any either, but you'll, there'll be a joy to be around. But anyways, long story long. Uh, I, I did hear that the other day. And I was like, man, that, that, that's so, so, so good. Uh, the next thing I will you know, say this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. The, in regards to that, I think a lot of things have changed for me in the past just year uh, from three years ago, taking over it just from a coaching perspective is when you go and look for those things, it is a lot easier to be positive and instead of falling into this coaching trap, which it is our job to look really far ahead and help and look for issues, but it just starts to relax you a little bit more and look for good things rather than constantly trying to look for bad things, which as you know, you'll find if you look hard enough and it's just right. brought a lot less stress uh, to the job. Right. No. And I, and I think, you know, all of the coaches that are listening right now, softball, baseball, whatever sport, they probably, if they've done it long enough, they've been around a team that is super talented, but it is brutal to go to work every single day. And you're just like, man, like what, what's going to come up? Like, how am I going to have to deal with it and put this fire out? You know, is this kid going to show up? It, it's just, <laughs> it, to me, it's not worth my time anymore. Like I want to, I want to dig into the, or, you know, pour into the kids and I want to help them get better. But at some point it's like, man, like we're going to have to make a change here. Like there's something needs to change, but it's draining. It can be oh, draining man, at times for sure. It's brutal. So talk about your, your process of, of, you know, building culture. I I think you hit on it pretty well, but before we, you know, before we move on to the, the on-field piece, is there anything else that, that you want to hit on as just far as, you know, so, so you've got, you've got your core values, you're commending your core values when you see them. Is there anything else that you guys do uh, just to, you know, to build a culture every day to shape the environment or just anything else that you want to hit on before we, we get to the on-field piece? Yeah. Uh, one thing, you know, I spent the whole entire summer, uh, 
I usually have a summer kind of goal and it could be a skill thing or it could be something else. My whole goal was just mental, uh, the mental game and mental conditioning, these guys. And so we kind of have done a lot, lot more and been very intentional on uh, mental meetings and PowerPoints and talking about that kind of stuff. And I think that's really fostered the culture and to look for good things in other people and stuff like that. And basically uh, culture wise too is, is, is how do I, you know, punish the team or if someone messes up or how do I go about that has changed 180 degrees uh, in the past eight, nine months since I really started to dive in this a little bit more. And I thought I had to make a change because I wasn't as happy uh, trying to hold up the standard. I was kind of always disappointed in a way. And, but with the disappointment, there was no learning going on. So therefore the culture won't grow. So basically uh, I always implemented, uh, you know, w- when something does go wrong, you have to uh, obviously address it. So I gave it, you know, implemented a 24 hour rule is no matter what, it's up to me, obviously, but I'm going to give this decision 24 hours a day or 24 hours before I start to make a decision, especially if it's drastic. So then I can calm down just like the players, you can get emotional and stuff like that and then make some poor choices. So uh, we started to do that. And then when it comes to culture, they're going to mess up. And in a way you almost want them to mess up uh, in certain situations. So you can teach what is right versus what is wrong. So we've had a couple of pretty, you know, early on, I think I would just punish the whole team. Hey, it's a team type deal, team issue. And I've now changed it uh, quite a bit where I I start off as an individual conversation. And uh, I love just the, you know, Justin Hare has been an awesome resource uh, over at Campbell where he talked about in a recent podcast of paying rent. And I just loved that concept where, Hey, uh, we're just going to pay for it at the end of the week. It's not anything crazy, but it is annoying for the players to have to do it. So they have to self police themselves a little bit more. It has literally dropped my blood pressure down quite a bit, knowing I can teach it at the end of the week of what the issue was, depending on how bad it was. And now I don't have to feel like I have to hurry up. I have to be the bad guy all the time and stuff like that is like, Hey, we messed up. We got to fix it as a team. And, uh, it's just been it's been a game changer for me to be honest. And I just thank Justin so much for the conversations we've had in regards to it. And it's just made my job a lot easier. Uh, Another culture thing that I thought was really good uh, was Ed Maffey. uh, And he is a phenomenal guy. Probably should get him on a podcast as well. He's been a good mentor to me and some of my other assistants. And basically he, well, I had a kid screw up. And I didn't know what to do. Should I kick him off the team? Should I keep him uh, through the fall, but kind of suspend him and, and going through all these things. And he came up with the idea of make him do a book report in front of the whole class about what he messed up on and some real life examples of guys who maybe lost their jobs because of this mistake. And, and he had to present it in front of the whole team. And I thought it was awesome. So all those kind of things, different ways to approach culture is I think when you think you're trying to build a huge culture is at least for myself, you think it's going to go or needs to go perfect. And when it doesn't, it kind of wrecks you. And I would just be just kind of angry all the time, or at least disappointed and not just enjoying this opportunity as much as I think I, I am now. And I think that's what I've changed from year one to now year three is more learning, you know, teaching culture, teaching good behaviors rather than forcing them and just being basically, uh, you know, an angry head coach. I love hearing that. And I think we're, you know, part of our job description should be uh, the process of behavior change. And, you know, in regards to the book report, in some ways, (laughs) In some ways, the player might have have uh, it may have been easier just to get rid of him rather than him having to do all of this stuff. So you, I guess you get to see how how really committed that he is. I, I love that idea, and I you know I even thought it, it was, was awesome. This, yeah. Oh, I, I, I bet. And uh, you know you're growing him, and uh, I even thought about like when somebody messes up, making them give a team apology in front of the team instead of like just running or whatever, like you know, you're late to, you're late to class or whatever. One of the first warnings would be like, Hey man, like you, you got to apologize to the team. You got to, you know, that's part of your, 
like you said, paying rent. And that's even hard. Like, I, I, I think that's minimum, uh, minimum required, but I, I think that, that that may be something that, that I try in the future. But I do want to go to uh, go back to, to the first thing that you said, which is, you know, and, and let me let me rewind again. I'm getting ahead of myself because I, I think that that what you're doing is really exciting and really cool. And Saban talked about this a lot, too. He said, we all we want to get on to a kid and then we want to kick them off the team but it doesn't necessarily change and help them grow into, you know, the, the man or, or woman that we want them to be. But, you know, I, I, with, with paying rent, can you, can you talk to us about and give us an example of what you mean by like at the end of the week, they have to do X, Y, or Z. And it doesn't have to be a real world example, but just something that uh, could give us a, just a more of a concrete understanding of, of how you do that. Right. So once again, I, I took this from Justin Hare. And so he's it, it, oh, he's phenomenal and he's really easy to talk to. And there's just a lot of similarities, how he goes about his business. I just really connect well with him. So he's going to be the better guy to probably break this down. But basically if a kid uh, misses weights or is late to weights, then obviously they have uh, what he called, they have to pay rent for that one um, offense. So at the end of the week on Fridays, what you'll do is they have to run 20 seconds, 26 seconds, depending on your ballpark size. Uh, and they just have to do a sprint there and back within 20 seconds, 26 seconds. And if they do it, the, the rent's paid, we move on. And then there's a chance he talks about where you can have that time where they're resting a little bit, depending if there's multiple infractions during that week uh, or culture things that you want to address where you can actually teach why these things might be, uh, bad and why do we need to get better at these type things and you know for instance if a kid misses weights he then misses practice because that's just how we do things here and so now that's two infractions so you missed weights but then you also missed practice and you might have missed a meeting so now we're at three and so it's just an opportunity to teach them hey your actions affect others and one action can affect two or three things down the road like i said if you miss weights, you miss practice. If you miss practice, you missed a meeting. So now you've now hurt your development uh, significantly and you hurt the team, uh, not only by paying this rent, but also from the development standpoint for you and the, and the team culture. No, no doubt. I, I love that. And uh, Justin, former guest of the show for listeners who mm -hmm. want to listen to him, you know, he, he was really, really good over at Campbell University in North Carolina. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I love that. And you're not you're leaving with the kid having an, a complete understanding of why it's important. And it's not just like, Hey, you were late. Okay. Yeah, like, you know, mm -hmm. at some point <laughs> kids need to understand, you know, what, you know, why we teach that. And I know that that seems very uh, basic, but to some kids it's like, maybe, maybe it's not. So I, I yeah, love and like that. I and, mentioned, it's, 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 it's helped me. And that's why I was so grateful for Justin to break it down and to hear. And this is also why you're always constantly trying to learn and listen to podcasts right. and do all that other stuff. I would have never heard that. And now, like when someone messes up, it would wreck my morning or it'd wreck my day. It would be on my mind this whole time. Now it's I'm able to relax a little bit, uh, per se. And now, hey, we're going to pay for this. They know it. But it's going to be at the end of the week. We don't have to start practice off by running triangles. And, and there's some times where you got to do that too. But in this instance, it's a, just more of a teaching moment rather than, hey, I checked this off the box. I ran them into the ground. And so now we're better. That just started to not make sense to me. And that's what I did, I think, the first two years versus what I'm doing now, which is drastically different and just felt like I've grown a lot because of that. Yeah, that's great. I love hearing that. So the next the next piece that, you know, that that I want to get into is, as I know, you're obviously a well thought out person. I think anybody who's listened to you for at least the last 20 minutes knows that you're very intentional with what you do. And uh, so I'd love to hear, you know, what have been your time restraints this fall? How have you decided to spend those? Uh, I know that that like different parts of the country are dealing with testing and covid as well uh, here. Uh, and it's a little bit different than in California versus New York versus, you know, state of Washington, whatever. So I'd love to hear just, you know, what, what your time looks like this fall, what have you chosen to really spend a bulk of it on and just kind of walk us through your calendar, if you don't mind. 
Yeah. So uh, last year was a complete dumpster fire, obviously here in California, but I think we made the best of it. Uh, and it didn't necessarily pay off, you know, in, in how we played. Uh, there's a lot of different elements to why uh, it was, it was a tough year, but it really changed and woke me up to, there has to be some changes going forward and how can we make it better uh, was the goal. So like I said, in the summer, I, I've had some talented players. Maybe they got a little bit too old. It's very hard to manage 24 year olds. Uh, I don't know if they should be playing college baseball. I'm not really sure. Or certain some shouldn't be, but so I was like, okay, I have good players and we have a great program and I have good kids off the field. So what, what's the missing piece? And so I was like, it has to be the mental side. And I was teaching the mental side, uh, especially on the pitching side. But as a team thing, we were going over a lot of these mental um, skills and concepts and stuff like that. I just looked in the mirror and I said, you know what? I might be teaching the right things, but I'm saying it completely the wrong way. And I need to be way more in the word has just been intentional with it. So uh, basically we've had a clean fall. Uh, the testing has been super easy. And we have no restraints with that. So when we first get back, it's eight hour weeks and four of hours can be strength and conditioning, which we max out. We lift four days a week. And then we have four hours of baseball stuff. In the past, it would be straight baseball for the most part and talk about some things here and there. This year, I have made it a point of emphasis to have um, more classroom time than I ever have Saturday morning breakfast uh, mental meetings and stuff like that has been a game changer for the players and for myself. Cause I get to work on myself while teaching them this, these skills as well. So that's, what's drastically changed from what year one and two to this year. And, or I don't even know what year this is three and a half COVID. I don't know. Uh, but it's been awesome. And so the other thing I've learned from Jay Johnson, who's now the head coach at LSU, who I, I played under, and is a huge mentor and a guy I can reach out to anytime. And he always picks up the phone. I'm just so grateful for that is slow down. And in the past, I wanted to teach so much stuff. I wanted to make sure like, Hey, I'm checking boxes and I'm doing all these other things. So this fall, the other thing was just slow down, break up the weeks, really almost over teach some skills uh, or concepts and then move on eventually rather than trying to teach three or four things. It is not easy to do, at least my brain. And so I want to teach four different things to the pitchers this week. I want to teach the team culture or some mental skill stuff. I want to teach it all in one hour and a half meeting. Uh, it is very difficult to dumb it down and make it a lot simpler, but, and really focus on that. Uh, but I'm telling you it once again has brought the job happiness up by doing it and just making sure that we've really hammered a certain area and really haven't left anything uncovered. No, I, I think, you know, on my coaching journey that players want clarity, like they want to understand, Hey, how do I play every day? Or how do I, you know, with, with guys, your, your older guys, how do I make all conference or how do I, how do I level up essentially? And unless we're, really providing clarity for them, then it, they're going to have a hard time because there's, <laughs> there's so much out there right now. And I mean, it's, it, mm -hmm. it can be a gift and a curse because you can learn a bunch, but you can also have your attention diverted to a, literally a thousand different directions. And, you know, I, I think most kids are on TikTok and Instagram more than Twitter now, but it's like, man, it's, it's really hard to learn in 30 second snippets. But if we want deep learning, I, I think that you're, you're doing an awesome job with that. That's, that's amazing. I think what's also helped uh, i don't even know if it's helped uh, it's just hey i think i was doing it wrong i think we were teaching the right stuff and but there's always a make it better way and i just think we're doing that now and i don't think you can do this you know you're kind of addressing new head coaches and stuff like that which i still am is what can i do differently to get through to these kids and them have even a better experience than they already have. Were our guys already having good experiences? Absolutely. Have we had success? Absolutely. But how do you, how do you improve that? And I just looked in the mirror and I just think there's just different ways to do it. And I think we're doing it right now. And I'm excited that there has been a change from year one to year three uh, and stuff like that, because I think the program's better for it. I'm better for it. And the family life is better for it too.
Oh, that's wonderful. I love hearing that. So with uh, with the clarity piece too, and I want to I want to dig in on the mental the mental side. You said you've you've taken the last year or so to really dig into that. Uh, but preceding both of those things, you actually sent me a book a couple of months ago, maybe a couple weeks ago, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I went through it a little bit after you did, but you bought it for your entire coaching staff. Tell us what that book was. Tell us how it changed your life and tell us how it made your life better. Yeah. So that was the elimination of hurry and the book. I got it once again, it was Craig Rochelle was speaking a four part series, uh, basically on, you know, Jesus was never in a hurry and he did a bunch of cool stuff. So why can't we do that, uh, as humans now? And, it was phenomenal. And instead of trying to teach, once again, it kind of tied in. It was perfect timing. Weird how things like that happen. But basically what it was, was don't be in such a hurry to teach five different things and, and stuff like that. And how do you eliminate a uh, hurry when you're hurried? It hurts your faith, but it hurts really everything. And in a way you got to You got to start organizing your day a little bit differently. So then you can eliminate and to free up more time. And it's a great book. And it then tied into just, like I said, it dove into the mental side uh, and how to teach it a whole lot better, but it started to come into time management and team stuff and, and how, how do we teach this to our players so they don't feel rushed because they're not going to play well, or how do they organize their day a little bit better, not to add more to their day, but how to have some time where you're quiet and relaxed and you'll see sheets uh, doing a great job and, and everyone else in the country right now seems to be doing a lot more breathing and meditation and stuff like that, just to slow down, uh, this world, we have so much access to literally everything all the time. It, it just it seems like you go from point A to point Z and now you're at the mercy of your day. So this book is phenomenal. I thought it was really good. Ended up buying it for every coach on campus during one of our athletic meetings and the feedback has been really good. And I thought of you and sent one to you too, because uh, Craig O'Shell's the man. And if he likes a book, I'm going to read it no. and I'm going to be all about it. No doubt. And highly recommend anyone, uh, Christian or not, to listen to his leadership podcast. Uh, really, you know, being the leader of such a large organization breaks it down into 20 minute you know, segments every, I think once a month. They're, they're at 100 episodes now, but really micro details on, you know, how to, how to run an organization and from the macro and micro level, which is really, really good. So with the clarity piece, uh, you know, what, what have you, what have you really had to, to scale back on? Uh, and, you know, there's so many things that we can do, but what have you really chosen on, you know, on back, back to the micro level, what have you really chosen to focus on this fall? You know, we talk about baseball being a game of fundamentals uh, playing catch and putting the ball in play and, you know, all of those things. But at the end of the day, we are all judged by how, how well we perform on a field. So it's like that delicate balance of we want to do simple things really well, but we also don't want to get caught for lack of a better term, you know, with, with not having prepared for certain situations, which we could spend all of our time on preparing for every situation that comes mm -hmm. up. So being the head coach and the leader of the program, uh, how have you, what have you guys chosen to really simplify and break down for this fall and adding layers to it as you go along? If, if any, and all of this makes sense, but I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, how you guys are spending that. Yeah. Uh, so with COVID not playing a bunch of games, I thought we just had to play more baseball, real baseball. And how can we practice, but yet play more baseball, I think was clarity. And this is going to sound super simple, but how in the world do we throw more strikes? How do we catch the baseball and how do we hit what we what we're looking for and how simple can we possibly make this? And a lot of it has to do with kind of just more external based training, which I believe in uh, hardcore, uh, especially from the pitching side and g getting out of the way a little bit. So some of the stuff that's, uh, you know, that we like to do is uh, that I really wanted to hone in on this fall was off speed outs. And either that's from the offensive end or from the pitching side is I wanted to track that a whole lot better and just really emphasize, Hey, high school kid coming in, 
uh, the difference between you and where you're going to be in a couple of years is your off speed command is going to have to get a whole lot better if you want to survive. Uh, our conference is pretty gnarly if you're throwing a ton of heaters. And obviously you have some guys who are plus heaters, but if you do that, it's going to be a long weekend. So you're going to have to be able to um, get better at that. So all we did is put an emphasis on it and track it. And it was, it was more of myself doing a better job of tracking it in a little bit different way. And so I just give them feedback, simple feedback on how many off speed outs did we get this inner squad versus uh, how many times were they waste pitches offensively uh, is the first couple of weeks. Keep it super simple. Uh, you know, we're looking only for this right now and it will individualize it a little bit later, but this is what you got to do to hit the baseball hard. And we've stolen so many things from so many different people, but uh, you know, I think in the past, maybe we tried to do too much and now a clouded mind or brain is not going to be a good baseball player Uh, catch play. Uh, what, and I don't even know if we're getting off subject here, but I can kind of give you some of the drills that we kind of to do, uh, and and stuff like that, that this is the first year I've done it. And there's just kind of random thoughts and I'm absolutely loving it. So if we're going to, if we're going to really hammer catch play, uh, and not only for first and foremost, if you haven't got into Monty Lee's infield catch play, uh, I love it. And basically it's playing catch and the way you play catch is you actually play it at your position to start the day rather than being on the right field line. So you start for three minutes, we give them three minutes on the right field line uh, and what we do. And once again, we jack this from him. So uh, then your guys are playing infield in, that's going to simulate their very first throws of the day. The catchers are in there. It works on accuracy, works on, you can roll them ground balls real light. So it's more of a real rep and stuff like that. And then they go to a medium range throw and then a long toss type throw that is like a cutoff stuff. So we do that every other day here. And then we give them freedom, long toss, throw it as far as you can, as much as you can on other days. And then we jacked uh, JT McGuire's outfield uh, pro step stuff. That's what our outfields do for their throwing program. And it's helped with their technique and accuracy uh, as well. So one of the things I'm, I, I'm pretty stoked on that we've done is we started to use the junior hack attacks in a whole lot more efficient way. And so basically when we ever enter squad, we uh, always have a hack attack on the sideline or foul uh, territory. And in order to get on the field and off the field, you have to do two mandatory picks. Uh, so we have the ball hitting the ground in the turf or wherever it might be. And we have two different cones. So like a, a good hop and then a nasty hop where you got to compete. So each guy, let's say we play an inner squad of nine innings. Uh, you have 18 going out. You have to pick and you have, also, when you get off the field, you have to do two picks also. So you're at 36 picks that you would have normally never done on a inner squad day. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to have the hack attack set up in our inner squad. And what it's going to be today is infield pop up. So you got to catch an infield pop up before you're allowed to go back into the dugout. And I haven't done it where you had to get both picks right to move on. It's not like a graduation thing. Eventually, it might get that way. But as of right now, it's just two attempts. And then you go, you're allowed to go in the dugout and it hasn't sped or, or slowed the games down. Um, and now I know, Hey, we've worked on pop-ups, uh, you know, with this individual guy, pop up priority, but one guy might only get three is now I know he got 36 and we do that every single time. Now going forward, I've been loving that. And you can make a, you can make any scenario up. You want to, it could be tag plays at second, be tag plays at, at home. It could be just quick tags, catching it from a catcher. How fast can we get? You can it, hack attacks endless, a, as you know. Uh, another thing uh, that we implemented is my favorite play in baseball, and I keep telling uh, all of our players, my favorite player uh, play, obviously three-run jack is awesome. My favorite play in baseball is a first baseman picking a ball or picks in general. So anytime an infielder, especially first baseman, we call him error saved, is every time he picks a baseball, I get excited. I just know it's such a game changer, and I don't think people realize how much of a game changer it is. And we want to do the sexy, uh, you know, hitting doubles and all that stuff. Obviously, we all love that stuff. But when an infielder picks a baseball, I mean, it is celebrated in this program. And I've implemented 30 picks every single day for uh, first baseman, no matter what your day Looks like you have to get in here early or after to get those done uh, or in between innings. And so uh, 
we've just been doing a lot of that and then just a lot of process stuff uh, from the pitchers. Uh, yeah, I spoke about it at the ABCA convention and, and stuff like that. We do a drill called the two minute drill where I get them warmed up. And it's, so it's simulated like they started a game. So they just start their day. They normally would, they're warmed up. And so it's not like they're going in their cold, but then they sit there for two hours in a real game. And then all of a sudden they have to go get hot and it might be a next batter situation or two batters. So what I'll do is I'll, they'll get warmed up. They'll sit in the dugout. They'll really be shagging and I'll yell a random name. I'll start the clock. Hey, you got two minutes. It's going to simulate you have two minutes and then I'm going to go for a mound visit and you're going to come into the game. And you see these dudes run like crazy. They don't realize how much two minutes actually is. And they're going to have to have a routine. Uh, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to panic and throw four balls off the top of the screen? And you got to teach them. And Scherzer talked about this last night, actually, in the Dodger uh, series, uh, Giants game, that, hey, you still have eight more pitches out there. And I don't think people use those eight pitches as good as they should. So we actually practice that as a bullet saver for if you're taxed or it's another additional a minute and a half or so that you can really hone in on your stuff. So we do that a lot. And so our pitchers aren't as overwhelmed uh, when they have to get ready really hot, ex- especially your relievers. And that's really helped, uh, you know, from the pitching side and not being so domed up that they can't throw, uh, you know, a pitch when there's two guys on and you're coming into a tight ball game in the eighth. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review wherever you are listening. I also wanted to remind you that you can find the video portion at the AOTC channel on stickandball.tv. Have a great week.